This is an old tongue twister. Some of you may remember. She sells seashells. And the rest of the tongue twister is by the seashore. Now there's all kinds of sea stuff at the seashore. There are sea jellies, which we used to call jellyfish. There are sea stars, which we used to call starfish. There's seaweed, which we pretty much always called seaweed. And if you're in Florida, usually from uh, April until the end of October, you might see some sea turtles coming up on the beach. But today we're going to talk about seashells. Now, what are seashells? We're going to talk about what they are. We're going to talk about how humans have used them over the centuries. And then we'll take a look at some specific types of seashells that are usually pretty common here in Florida. So what are seashells? Seashells are a calcium carbonate hard substance that surrounds an animal called a mollusk. Now the, uh, the shell is actually part of the mollusk's body. It can't come in and out of it, take it on and off. And the animal makes the shell get bigger and bigger and bigger as it grows. Now it's not a skeleton. This, this animal is classified as an invertebrate. It doesn't have a skeleton, doesn't have a spine, but it builds this shell as it grows. And one of the types of mollusks grows spirally. So you can see here in the center where the animal started off and then it grows spirally and spirally and spirally until you get to fairly big size. And if we broke off one of these shells, you could see inside how it grows. Bit by bit, protein and calcium solidify into a shell. Nature creates a rock hard house for the mollusk. So that kind of a mollusk is known as a gastropod. And the other kind of mollusks are called bivalves. These ones have two shells. And here's an example of a clam. The animal uh, can't come out of the shell, just like the gastropod. And it is constantly adding onto the shell, making it bigger and bigger. So the most common shells you see in Florida are what are called univalves and bivalves. There are other kinds of mollusks, but these are by far the most numerous. Now the word valve is an old English word that meant panel or door. So univalve means that the animal has one shell. And some examples of that are conchs, whelks, and olives. A bivalve is an animal that has two shells. And some examples of that are clams, oysters, and mussels. Now let's look at univalves a little bit more closely. Okay, we, uh, we also know them as marine snails. So the terrestrial snails, marine snails, they're all uh, univalves. And many of them are born with their shell and the shell expands as the animal grows. Many of them are carnivorous. That means they're meat and they like to go after other mollusks. So what they do very often is they drill holes in their prey, their mollusks. And usually they're going after the bivalves. So here's an example of an animal after it's been attacked by a gastropod. The gastropod drills a nice clean hole in it and sticks its tongue down there and gets the contents and the, the bivalve is no more. Uh, most of the univalves are mobile. They move around on the sand or just below the sand. They're always out in the water, never usually on shore. And um, most of them move on to just below the sand or the mud. Now, bivalves are sort of the opposite. Bivalves primarily are filter feeders. They don't really eat meat. They filter the water and they actually help clean it. They take detritus and other kinds of plankton and stuff out of the water. Uh, so they can filter it and clean it. Um, oysters can filter 50 gallons of water a day. So they're very essential for keeping a clean environment. Some bivalves move within the sand, but a lot of them are sedentary. Uh, scallops can actually swim. We'll see a picture of that a little bit later. And uh, many bivalves that are stationary 
are anchored either to rocks or to the sand or even to each other. And oysters are the most common example of that. Oysters anchored together in large reefs that help uh, provide habitat for other animals and also help protect the, the shore from waves and erosion. Okay, so let's think about how shells have been used by humans over the centuries. You might have some ideas that you can think of to yourself now, but um, let's suppose that you're a Stone Age hunter and you're hungry. One thing you could do is go out and try to bring down a mastodon or a woolly mammoth that looks like a tough job. Or you could do like the Native Americans used to do before their horses. They would drive the bison over a cliff and pick them up down at the bottom of the cliff. Or if you were taking a vacation at the beach, you might see this big old lump of meat moving around very slowly and easy to pick up. And it's got this easy opening top. And it's sort of like a prehistoric TV dinner. It just comes in its own casing. So you can just plop that on the fire and you have yourself a nice meal. And when you're done eating it, you look at this empty shell now, it's, uh, it's very hard and heavy. So that might be useful as a hammer. It also is watertight, so it might be useful for carrying water. So that gives us two of the uses that the humans might have for shells. One is for food, and the other is for tools and weapons. Shells have been used for building material. They've uh, paved roads with shells, and also they've used shells to create concrete, because the lime in the shell is used to bind the concrete. Uh, people have used shells for decorations, either on themselves or around the house, different kinds of ornaments, and also shells have become symbols. That means they represent something else. So let's take a look at some examples of each of these. In terms of bivalves, these are the kinds of bivalves that might be useful for food. So a lot of people like to use oysters up on the top left there. And down on the bottom are uh, mussels, which very often come from Brussels. In Brussels, you can get a, de a meal called uh, moule frites. So that's going to be mussels with French fries. In the univalve side of the road, uh, you can get conch food. Conch fritters, for example, you take a conch shell, you take out the animal, you pound it into submission, and then you fry it up in bread, and you've got your wonderful conch fritters. Also, the famous uh, French food is escargot. That's made from shells. Now, technically, that's not seafood because predominantly they use uh, terrestrial shells, but it, it is shell food. Uh, weapons and tools. Various Indian and Native American tribes and even people around the rest of the world have used uh, different kinds of shells for tools and weapons. The Calusa Indians here in Florida are probably the first major shell users. Um, they, were, they were a tribe that was pretty dominant in South Florida for almost 2,000 years up until about the arrival of the Spanish. They sort of died out in 1700 or so, and um, they use shells very often. Here's an example. They're using some shells to carve out a canoe. The Calusas um, were not agricultural. They fished and they hunted, so they needed these canoes to get around uh, in the swamps, or they even uh, built some canals that can help them get around. This is an example of a Calusa village from hundreds of years ago. You can see they've used shells in a variety of ways. They've even used shells as uh, material for putting their houses on. Here's an example of a clam scoop or digger that they might have used. You can see right there is a worn out area for a thumb. Uh, whelks 
also very hard shells. Um, one on the right there was carved down into an amulet. They wear this on their, around their neck. Or you might take a whelk shell and cut it in half and sharpen it up. And now you've got a nice tool for carving. Again, you could carve wood or even other shell material. Or you could use it to carry water for that matter. You could drill a hole in a, in a whelk shell, stick a stick in it, and now you've got a nice pick or an ax or, or weapon to use. This is a pen shell known as a sawtooth pen shell. It's got a very rough surface. So if we look closely, you can see that it might be used as a file or a rasp. Heavy shells could be used to weight down a net. Just cut a hole in them and then tie them up to your net. Or you could take the more delicate shells like these olive shells and carve them down and use them to weigh down fishing lines. Um, a lot of different cultures have used shell for jewelry. You know, maybe they saw these shells with holes in them on the beach and they decided, well, let me drill my own hole. And then you could use them for all kinds of decorations. You could use them for earrings. So the earrings on the right there are from Native Americans. And this is a pre-Columbian set of earrings. So that means it's earlier than the 1500s. The ones in the middle and on the left, they're more modern jewelry using shells as earrings. Uh, you can use shells to make necklaces. Again, up on the top, we see uh, necklaces that are hundreds of years old. And down on the bottom there, in the, in the middle with the skeletons, those necklaces were found in a uh, funeral site in Brittany, France. And it was about 5,000 years old, they reckon. So that's a pretty, pretty old set of necklaces right there. And on the left is a more modern necklace with a scallop shell and some, uh, some glass beads. Cowrie shells, these are all cowrie shells. Cowrie shells are a symbol of prosperity and fertility and for many places they were used as, uh, as money. So they were very highly thought of. Uh, here we have uh, cowrie shells being used to make necklaces and then to uh, decorate somebody's flip-flops. And if you were well-dressed Native American in South Florida two or 300 years ago, you wouldn't be quite dead without your scallop necklace. People have used shells for decorations. This looks like a wonderful bouquet of flowers, but if you look really closely, you'll see that it's all a bunch of shells. And this creative person here used their shells to decorate their Volkswagen. People have been collecting shells for hundreds of years, just as a hobby. They collect them, they sort them, maybe they trade them, who knows, but they, they like to have them. Uh, shells have been instrumental in different cultures. The, uh, the Buddhists believe that if you blow through a conch shell, it uh, reduces the negative energy that's around. And of course, most folks have heard the uh, myth that if you hold the shell to your ear, you're hearing the ocean. Now, I hate to break, break it to you folks, but uh, you're not really hearing the ocean. What you're hearing is wind currents. So if you had a big empty box or a glass or something, you'd probably hear the same thing. Um, shells have been used as symbols. That means they represent something else. I told you the cowrie shells are a symbol of fertility. The scallop shell has a lot of different uh, interpretations. It's also sometimes a symbol of fertility. So here we have a famous painting by Botticelli of the Venus goddess of love arising from a scallop shell. It's one of the myths of her creation. This uh, patch on the bottom there, that's also supposed to be a scallop shell. And it's a memento from something called the Camino de Santiago. Well, Santiago 
the St. James, and uh, supposedly there were relics of his body found in about nine, 900 uh, AD. They were taken to a place in northern Spain, it's called Santiago de Compostela, and pilgrims have been making journeys to that site for hundreds of years. They come from all over. So this, the shell represents a couple of things. It represents the journeys from different places to one central location. And there are many scallop shells along the coast there in northern Spain. So presumably the pilgrims kept the scallop shell that they found on the beach as sort of a souvenir. And people are still making that trek, uh, the Camino de Santiago. Shells are very often found in coats of arms. The scallop shell can indicate that somebody in your family uh, was in a naval battle or uh, went to the Crusades. The shell in the middle there, the circular shell, is not a bivalve or univalve. This is an animal called a chambered nautilus, and it's actually a cephalopod. Uh, which is a different category of mollusks, but the spiraling was supposed to meant the evolution of life or eternity. And the Pope, Pope Benedict, has a scallop shell on his on his uh, coat of arms, and uh, in this instance, the scallop shell represents baptism or rebirth. And a lot of Catholic churches, the baptismal font where they baptize babies is shaped like the scallop shell. Uh, how about construction? Shells have been used in construction, a variety of ways. The early settlers in uh, the Carolinas and Georgia and Florida made something called tabby. Not, not that kind of tabby. Tabby is a uh, mixture of shells and sand and water and other stuff. And again, the, uh, the lime in the shells, when they cook it all up, makes everything stick together. So they could make primitive bricks out of this tabby and then uh, build a hut or a house or whatever you want. Now shells are used in the construction of this fort indirectly. It looks like a big bunch of, uh, of blocks. This is the Fort San Marco in St. Augustine, which is several hundred years old. But the rocks that compose the walls of the, of the fort if you look at them really closely, they're really sedimentary rocks which were formed by hundreds of tiny coquina shells being merged together over the centuries. And uh, the coquina shells sort of make the wall a little bit elastic. So when cannonballs hit the walls, they sort of bounced off without creating much damage. So uh, that type of shell construction really helped out the the people that were defending uh, inside of Fort San Marco. One of the most uh, astonishing examples of, of shells being used for construction is this place. It's called Mound Key. It's an island off of Estero. Estero is the uh, section of Florida where Fort Myers Beach is located. And this island off of Fort Myers Beach uh, Mound Key was actually a creation of the Calusa. They just kept building up, building up mounds of seashells, and they created this entire island, which they believe was a, some type of ceremonial place for the Calusa. And the, um, the island is still there. It's about 30 feet over the water, but the shells go down and down and down to almost the bottom. Uh, you can go there. The only way to get there is by boat. Uh, you have to take your own boat. Or you could possibly use a canoe kayak that you rent from Kurashan Historic uh, Park, which is not it's several miles away. So if you see the picture up on the left there, uh, Fort Myers Beach, right off the end is Fort Myers Beach is where the Mound Key is. Okay, just a little science. Uh, this is as technical as we get. Um, it's the phrase here, King Philip came over for great spaghetti. This has meaning to scientists 
that study uh, something called taxonomy, which is the classification of animals and plants. And the King Philip came over for great spaghetti is a mnemonic device for remembering the different categories used in taxonomy. So we have King Philip came over for great spaghetti. And King stands for kingdom. Philip stands for phylum. Came stands for class, over for order, for, for family, great for genus, and spaghetti for species. Now, when scientists refer to animals, they predominantly use genus species to identify the animal. Uh, it can get more complicated than this. There are suborders and subfamilies and subspecies, but these are the major categories. And the way it works is that one kingdom can have several phylum and one phylum can have several classes and a class can have several orders and an order can have several families and so on and so on and so on down this we call upside down tree structure. So let's look at a couple of different animals and see what the taxonomy would say about them. First we we'll look at the eastern oyster bivalve and its kingdom is Animalia, it's an animal, that means it's not a plant. Phylum has to do with the structure of the animal at a very high level. So mollusk, mollusca means it has a shell. It's not a backbone, it doesn't have a spine. It's an invertebrate. Now, as we said, mollusks come in different classes. So the Eastern oyster would be a bivalvia order, Ostreota, family, etc., genus, and species. So the Virginica Crassosteria is the name that scientists would give to the Eastern Oyster. If we look at the fighting conch, which is a unit valve, okay, it's still an animal and its phylum is still mollusk, but its class is Gastropoda. Now that is a Latin pair of words that means foot, stomach. The gastropod's stomach is on top of its foot. Okay, some basic facts about seashells. Um, there are mollusks in the fossil records dating back from 545 million years ago. There are over 150,000 known mollusk species and way more than half of them are either bivalves or univalves. They're found in almost every ecosystem, even Antarctica has its share of mollusks. The largest shell in the world is a giant clam, about 500 pounds, four feet across. The smallest shell is the Acmela nana, which is three hundredths of an inch. And there are mollusks that really don't have shells. They've evolved and their shell has gone away. So some examples of those would be squids and octopus, which are also cephalopods, they're not bivalves or univalves, or slugs and sea hares. Uh, let's take a look at the anatomy of these animals in a little more detail. The bivalve, as we said, has two shells and many bivalves have these two siphons coming out from the shell. Now they can pull that inside the shell for protection, but uh, when they want to feed, they'll put out the siphons and they will siphon in water from one side and blow it out on the other. Now when the water goes in, it goes over their gills, which then strain the water, take out the detritus or phytoplankton that the uh, animal is going to eat, and then the excess is pushed out. The, uh, the siphon on the right with the little sort of hairs around the edges, that's the one that traps the food and the water and helps it get into the pipe. And then the other one just pushes the water out. And uh, if a bivalve has siphons like this, it's more than likely going to be found in the water under the sediment, under the sand, under the mud, and it'll use the siphons to sort of poke out and get its food and to breathe and hide most of its body under the, under the sand. It can pull in the siphon really quickly when danger occurs. 
So here's the inside of a bivalve that has siphons and you see it's got other organs like people, it's got heart, it's got kidneys, it's got a stomach, it's got the muscles to hold the shells together, it's got a mouth, it's got a little nervous system called a ganglion, it's got a lot of stuff. This is the way a bivalve interior would look when it doesn't have the siphons, it still has all the other organs, um, but the water comes in and gets filtered directly through the gills and then gets pushed out. So it's still filtering water, it's still taking food and nutrition out of the water, but it's just doing it a different way. And uh, to see a bivalve from the outside, you usually see two, two shells together like this. Very often they're symmetrical like this. And the growth rings show the way that it expands. Uh, the rings aren't created in any set period of time, so you can't count them to see how old the animal is or anything like that. Uh, the shell itself has really got three layers. Uh, the first layer, the outer layer, is very thin, a kind of a protein. It's called the periostracum. It took me about three weeks to figure out how to pronounce that. And it helps prevent the inner layers a little bit from boring organisms. The, the shell that we think of is the uh, prismatic layer. That's the calcium carbonate hard stuff that uh, makes up the majority of the shell. The animal is cons constantly sort of packing these little prisms of calcium carbonate against the periostracum and against the other prisms of carbonate to create a thicker and thicker and bigger shell. The nacreous layer is iridescent in a lot of animals and it sort of uh, connects the shell to the mantle, which is the fleshy part of the animal, so they're sort of stuck together there. And in the, in the case of certain oysters, uh, the uh, nacreous layer will surround an object that's irritating the bivalve and produce a pearl. Now bivalves that don't move secrete a uh, sort of a hairy substance, which is called byssus. It comes out and it's very fine. And it's so fine that it can even grab onto little bits of debris in the sand um, to help hold the animal from moving around. And sometimes it has sort of a uh, sort of an adhesive quality to it, so it, can, it holds to bricks and other kinds of stone. Um, but it's such a fine, hairy item that people have actually used it to make what's called sea silk. And the sea silk is cleaned and woven down into things like gloves. They've been doing this for hundreds of years. Some people still do it. And um, since business sounds a lot like business, it gave me this idea. <laughs> I was going to play my guitar and sing that for you, but I figured you'd probably turn the sound off. Anyway, uh, getting a little bit more into uh, bivalves, let's talk a little bit about the life cycle of a bivalve, in this case, the oyster. Um, when the time is right, the oysters uh, emit eggs and sperm, and somehow they mix together in the water, create a fertilized egg. Uh, temperature of the water has to be between 74 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit for this to happen. Uh, once the egg is fertilized, it changes uh, eventually into what's called a veliger. There are a couple of different types. 
initially it's called the straight hinge Belliger, and then um, the late Belliger, and then finally it grows that foot that most bivalves have, and it's called a petty Belliger. So it takes about two weeks for the oyster to do all that. And it's moving around in the uh, currents. It's not located itself yet. So uh, eventually it finds a spot to land on. And in the case of oysters, it uh, becomes what's called spat. And the spat emits a cement-like substance, like I said, on the byssus threads, and that holds it to a rock. And then uh, the oyster that's there eventually will emit its own sperms or eggs, and the process will continue. And oysters tend to find each other. So the old oysters will be places where the new oysters will land, and eventually you'll have a nice oyster reef. Um, the bait scallops do something very similar. The, uh, they admit the eggs and sperm, create the veligers, and the veligers become spat, but they usually attach themselves to seagrass, and eventually the scallops, uh, when they grow up, they move around, so they're not sedentary like oysters are. Well, let's take a look at some specific types of bivalves and gastropods. Maybe you want to test yourself to see if you know what these are. Uh, this one happens to be our famous Eastern oyster. And as I mentioned already, the oysters like to form these large reefs, um, provides habitat for other animals. It's actually more space um, with all that in and out and up and down 50 times what it would be if it was just a flat surface there. So small fish and other animals can hide in the oyster reefs. Oysters actually provide food for animals like oyster drills and oyster catcher birds. But for humans, they uh, help protect the, the shoreline from erosion and from wave action. They're a popular human food, and uh, like I said earlier, they can filter about 50 gallons of water per day, so it's good for them to be around. They need a certain uh, mix between fresh and salty water, more salty than fresh. So if there's too much fresh water coming out of an estuary, uh, it can kill the oyster population, and that's happened a lot up in the Panhandle area of Florida. Uh, they can get to be about six inches long. Okay, take a second or two and think if you can identify this guy. This is an angel wing, very delicate, pretty shell, usually white, but can also be sort of a pink. It's a very fragile shell. And the, uh, the animal inside the angel wing shells is... Um, very large, it can't actually retract itself entirely into the shell. What it does tend to do is rock back and forth to make holes in the sand or even into rock and eventually will bury itself and stick out the siphons like we saw so it can breathe and, and also feed. These are used for food in Cuba. It's a very labor intensive process to, har to harvest them. It takes about a year or so for them to be uh, marketable size, which is about two and a half inches. But if you leave them alone, they can grow to be about eight inches. Okay, this one, we've seen uh, examples of this already. These are our famous symbols from the Crusades. Uh, this is a scallop shell, particular base scallop. And the muscle there, the abductor muscle, is what people like to eat from the base scallop. Now you have to be a little bit careful when you order scallops because some unscrupulous restaurateurs will cut holes or punch chunks out of sea skates. And so you get this chunk of meat that you think is a scallop, but it's actually part of the wing of a sea skate. So you have to be careful that you don't go to the wrong restaurant when you order your scallops. Uh, here's a pretty picture of the scallop from the top. And along the edges of the base scallop are these uh, 
little blue dots, which are really eyes, and each eye has its own individual retina, but they don't merge together to form uh, an image. So they're more really there just to identify light and dark and, and let the scallop know when something's around. But they do tend to move around. They like to hide in seagrass areas and they filter their food like the clams and oysters do. But like I said, they can move around. They clap their valves together and they can scoot around the bottom of the water there. So here we have a sea scallop getting ready to go. So it's like a little jet engine there scooting around. Okay, next topic is the coquina clam. Now the coquina clam, word coquina means small clam in Spanish. These are very small, but they're very pretty. They like to stay in the wet sand along the shoreline. They move up and down the shore as the tide comes in and out. They stay just below the surface. They, they have siphons like other clams. So they siphon there to get their food. They're very pretty. They come in various colors and they're known as the butterfly clam because of this uh, formation. Uh, they're fed upon by little birds. They dig them out of the sand and you can see on the bottom there how small they can be. And the, uh, the way they move up and down the beach uh, following the tide line is sometimes known as the dance of the coquinas. And as you can see from the size, they're only about three quarters of an inch. <laughs> That's the coquina dance. Now, this is an example of a cockle shell called the Florida prickly cockle. And you can see from a close up there why it's called prickly. There's another side view. Now, remember what I told you before that some gastropods can climb on top of bivalves and drill into them? Well, this is sort of the bivalves defense, the prickles on the top hopefully uh, dissuade a gastropod from climbing on top. Uh, it's got a pretty interior once it's all dried out. And you can see close up there, the little hole where the business threads come out. Um, this cockle shell can be found clinging to rocks and sand. Um, and people eat it like clams. It's also called, they're known as a heart clam because of the symmetrical shape. Now, when I was a kid, there was a nursery rhyme, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, and it had a line in it, silver bells and cockle shells. And that's the only place where I've heard that word before. And it sounds all nice, silver bells and cockle shells and a pretty maids all in a row and Mary, Mary's garden. But if you research the origin of that, a nursery rhyme, it's actually talking about Queen Mary, who was known as Bloody Mary because she liked to execute people that were fighting against her. And silver bells and cockle shells are euphemisms for the kind of torture devices that she was using. So uh, you might want to do a little research there and see what those silver bells and cockle shells really refer to. Okay, let's take a look at the univalves now. These are the gastropods and they have one shell, usually a spiral like this. The animal has tentacles. Uh, two of them usually contain eyes and if they have another pair, those are usually uh, smell organs. They have a mouth, they have a head, they have a foot in the back which helps propel them. And if we look inside, they also have organs similar to the bivalve. They have gills and 
They have a kidney and a heart and they have a mouth and in the mouth is something like a tongue called the radula. And on the radula are tiny, 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 tiny teeth called denticles. And depending on the type of univalve, the set of denticles are different. And these are the teeth that can help the univalve uh, drill into a shell of a, of a bivalve or even another univalve. Now, a lot of the univalves are carnivorous. They're very aggressive. They're very dangerous to small animals. You know, they'll eat whatever they can get at. They'll even eat uh, detritus and debris, you know, dead fish and stuff like that in some instances. Um, and as I said, they'll drill into a bivalve or even another univalve to get at their food. So they're very, very dangerous. And they call this the revenge of the escargot. You know, the escargot is what the French folks like to eat. What we saw there was a tulip shell, a true tulip. Again, it's a very voracious animal. Uh, there you see it scooting along on its foot. Um, the animal has the hard shell that we've seen already. And then that thing at the end of its foot is known as the operculum. That will basically serve like a trap door. When the animal pulls its whole body inside the shell, that operculum is very hard. It's hard as the shell, and so it can help protect that animal from attack. A true tulip is a little bit larger than a banded tulip, and they're very often confused. But if you look closely, you can see the, the banded tulip gets its name because it is a very, very well-defined set of bands. The true tulip does have bands, but they sort of uh, fade in and out, and almost like dashes instead of solid lines. But they're both, they're both very voracious, very aggressive uh, univalves that eat whatever they can get in, even decaying animals. And they'll thrash around if you try to pick them up. The uh, true tulip gets to be about eight inches long and the banded tulip maybe four inches or so. Here we have the largest shell in Florida. And you probably all know that that is the horse conch. What you might not know is that it's not really a conch. We'll talk later about what makes a shell a conch, but it is very large. It's uh, actually a type of tulip shell and you can see how large it is next to that little boy there. But it starts out as a baby, smaller than a penny. It's usually a pretty bright orange color when it's a baby and it gets to be sort of a dark brown, uh, the shell when it's larger. The, the flesh inside stays sort of a bright orange color. And just like the, uh, the tulip that it's really a member of the family of, it has a perculum the same as the other two did. And it loves to eat other things. In this case, it's attacking a lightning rope. It likes to forage in seagrass beds, sandy sediments. And like we said, it can get to be very big, about two feet long. It's the largest uh, shell in Florida. Here's a very pretty shell. It's called a lightning whelk because it has those uh, stripes that look like lightning bolts. And um, it also has the operculum like tulip shells. And here it's a very, very creamy color. Sometimes it's lighter in color than this. 
And welts tend to have a very distinctive top. You have this sort of flary edges coming around that uh, make it very distinct. Now, what some people find on the beach where they think it's a, a skeleton from a snake actually is an egg casing from a lightning whelk. So really a set of egg casings. The lightning whelk can get to be about 16 inches long. And it has what's called a left-handed spiral, which we'll talk about in a minute, very unique shape. So let's take a look at the egg capsules in a little bit more detail. Inside of each of these capsules are many, many, many eggs okay, of baby lightning whelks. There's several dozen in each capsule. And uh, that's how they look when they hatch. They're miniature versions of their mother. Now, some of the eggs never hatch. What they do is they provide food for the ones that have hatched. So there are babies and they're already starting to eat other things. They do come with a little bit of a yolk sack. So they have that to live on until they get large enough to, to eat other things. Now, gastropods, most of them have spirals and some of the ones that um, you see on the beach, like this fighting conch, or this horse conch, or this knobbed whelk, you notice if the, if the point is facing down, there's an opening on the right-hand side of the gastropod. But if we look at the lightning whelk, the opening is on the left-hand side. That's very, very unusual. And it's so unusual that people were making money selling these lightning whelks to uh, natives of India, because in, in India, some of the Hindus believe that a left-handed shell, which they don't have there at all, is good luck. <laughs> so people from Florida would take these lightning whelks, which are common here, and send them to India and so on because they're valued there because they're rare there. Another uh, very voracious gastropod is this one. Some people might recognize this. This is a moon snail. Now, when the snail is active, the body extends fairly far out and it uses that foot to move around and attack other animals. And this one is very well known for drilling into bivalves. That's sort of its calling card. It drills, drills, drills into those bivalves, sticks the tongue in with the radula and snatches out the meat, and it can really, really, really do a job on a bivalve in a short period of time. Uh, the eggs that are laid by the moon snail usually have a gelatinous coating around them, which adheres to the sand. So the moon snail is under the sand, lays the eggs, presses it up against the sand on top, then sort of digs its way out. And what's left behind is this cone and this sort of camouflages the eggs, helps protect them until these snails hatch. They can eat several bivalves a day. They can drill one of those holes in about 10 minutes. And they're not too big, maybe maximum size about three inches. One more carnivorous univalve is this one. It's called the Florida Lace Murex. Very, very pretty. These like to drill into oysters. And what they noted for is um, shells in the Murex family, especially in the Mediterranean, are used to create the color purple. Now the shell itself is very small, about three inches. So as you can imagine, you don't get a lot of juice out of those things. You get a couple of drops of the color purple. And that's one reason why purple was the symbol of the elite and the roy royalty because it was such an expensive item to create. You know, to, you had to kill thousands and thousands of these shells and put them out to dry and, and then squeeze the liquid out of them in order to create the color. So it was a very labor intensive process and very expensive. This is a lettered olive. It's a very predatory shell. It also has this wide 
foot that extends when it's moving around. It sort of helps keep the sand off the shell and gives it that polished appearance. It moves around in the sand. It attacks small clams like the coquinas, smothers them and then eats them. But the shell itself is very, very nice. It's got this polished appearance with uh, what looks like letters. The exit legs are free floating and the shell gets to be about two and a half inches long. Uh, some shells that are not carnivorous, this guy here is a Florida fighting conch. And you can see it's poking its eyes out there. It's called a fighting conch because it also likes to thrash around when you pick it up. There you see a close up of the eyes. And its operculum is a little different than the other shells. It looks a little bit more like a sword and it will use this to to push at you if you try to pick it up. It also has been seen fighting with other males. This is an example of their egg mass. It's a, sort of a miniature version of what the lightning rope does. And there get to be about four inches long. Now, one of the unusual gastropods is this guy. This is known as a common slipper shell. And it's unusual because it doesn't have that spiral. It's got just a sort of a simple arc shape. If you look at it from the bottom, it looks almost like a boat. So that's why people sometimes call it a boat shell. And it doesn't move around like most gastropods do. It actually forms a stack, uh, females on the bottom, males on top. They just stack themselves and stay that way. And each one is filtering their own individual food. Um, the females are on the bottom. Now, if they die, what happens is one of the males on the top, usually the next largest male will become a female. And then they restack. So that the females are always on the bottom. So the males can become females. That can't go the other way. Um, but only males can become females. This last shell we're going to talk about is the uh, deer cowrie shell. Remember I said cowrie shells are highly thought of. They're very pretty. They represent uh, destiny and fertility. Good luck. The deer cowries are the largest type of cowries in the world. They're not found too much up here in Naples. They're found more in the Florida Keys. They tend to have this beautiful set of spots on them like a fawn. That's why they have the name deer cowries. So they were used as money. And the Egyptians actually put cowrie shells over the eyes of their mummies to help guide them into the afterworld. And as I said, they can get fairly large, about seven inches. Now, I mentioned before that a horse conch isn't really a conch. So what makes a conch a conch? A conch has to have this notch called a stromboid notch in order to be a real conch. And if you are a real conch, you are by definition a vegetarian. So, horse, so, so crown conchs are not really conchs. Horse conchs are not really conchs. But queen conchs, fighting conchs, those are really conchs, so they're going to be vegetarians, and they have that stromboid nut. And what Michael said is, is definitely true. It's illegal to pick up live shells. And actually, you know, I don't want to be a spoil sport here, but you should minimize how many dead shells you pick up because the shells actually help prevent erosion of the soil. And some of them that get washed back out into the water provide habitat for hermit crabs. So, you know, if everybody's picking up every shell that they find on the, along the beach, eventually there aren't going to be any. So, you know, be a little bit more discerning about picking up shells. If you know, a three-year-old kid, that's one thing. But if you're an adult, yeah. you've probably seen enough shells, you don't need to take everyone home with you. A little bit of shell trivia, scallop trademark that's uh, used by Shell Oil recalls its beginning as an importer of exotic shells. And the octopus and squid are mollusks, even though they do not have a shell. They're known as cephalopods. And Key West is also known as the Conch Republic. 
Finally, I mentioned that um, you know shells are three layers, and we have a hard calcium carbonate that makes up the um, majority of the shell. But what you don't realize is how strong these shells are. They they're designed to withstand the pressure of the ocean. So this uh, little shell from a bivalve, I stuck it under a bunch of bricks right down there in the bottom, and it held up. So you can imagine how long it holds up under the water. So a couple of acknowledgements. That's the end of the show.